So if you'll recall, at the very, very beginning of the course, we did the how to read philosophy exercise, where we went through the paper sort of word by word, line by line, and we went very slowly, uh, figuring out each uh, meaning of the sentence. And that has hopefully been useful the whole uh, semester. So all of the stuff we're reading is very complicated. All of the stuff we're reading, you want to go very slow. I think in the free will uh, section, the papers get sort of the most complicated, or at least some of the papers get the most complicated. And so I just wanted to sort of remind you of the techniques that you want to use when you're reading uh, these papers. And so as an example, we'll take a sentence from page 830 of the Frankfurt article. Um, so this sentence, however, there may be circumstances that constitute sufficient conditions for a certain action to be performed by someone and that therefore make it impossible for the person to do otherwise but that do not actually impel the person to act or in any way produce his action. And so notice this is a very long, complicated sentence with lots of long, complicated ideas. And so how do you approach a sentence like this? When you find a sentence like this in this paper, what do you do? Well, we start off with the very first word, however. So however is a word that signals a contrast. So whatever was coming before, now we're sort of going against it. We're changing, we're saying something different. And so to understand what's going on here, we'll want to first understand what's coming before. So let's go back up to this previous paragraph. In seeking illustrations of the principle of alternate possibilities, it is most natural to think of situations in which the same circumstances both bring it about that a person does something and make it impossible for him to avoid doing it. So this is its own complicated sentence. So we'll start in seeking illustrations of the principle of alternate possibilities. So by this point in the article, we should know what the principle of alternate possibilities is, but just in case we don't, we go back and we look. Um, he says, here's the principle of alternate possibilities. This principle states that a person is morally responsible for what he has done, only if he could have done otherwise. So uh, in seeking illustrations of the principle of alternate possibilities, so in seeking illustrations, so examples or illustrations of the principle, so these are gonna be things that sort of show why the principle is true or give examples of how the principle works. He says, in seeking illustrations, it's most natural to think of situations in which the same circumstances both bring it about that a person does something and make it impossible for him to avoid doing it. So we have two things here. We have thing number one, bring it about that a person does something. That's number one. Maybe we'll put a little one over here. And make it impossible for him to avoid doing it. We'll call that number two. So we have one and two, and we're supposed to think of situations in which the same circumstances do both of these. So the same circumstances do both number one and number two. So what is number one? Bring it about that a person does something. So this is, um, if I try to understand what this means, maybe I reword it, I rephrase it in my own words. So what does bring it about mean? Um, maybe that means cause. So if I bring something about, I cause something, or I uh, make something occur. So I bring it about, I cause, I make something occur, that a person does something. So that's just very, very vague, a person doing something, just some sort of action. So I have number one, cause a person doing a thing or make a person do a thing. That's a the same circumstances do this. And number two, make it impossible for him to avoid doing it. So um, I'm trying to think of synonyms for make it impossible, but I can't really think of anything that's sort of about as straightforward as I can get. So make it impossible and then avoid doing it. That would be not to do it. So make it impossible not to do it. So a person, it causes a person to do a thing and it makes it impossible for them not to do the thing. Okay, so I'm trying to think of same circumstances do both of these. And I'm trying to think, well, what would be a situation where the same circumstances do both of these? Uh, maybe that's tough to think of for now, so I'll put that off for a moment. These include, oh, good, so he's about to give me examples of this, so I don't have to think of my own yet. But it would be good if I could. Maybe I'm sort of too confused at this point, but let's go. These include, for instance, or sorry, for example, situations in which a person is coerced doing, into doing something or in which he is impelled to act by a hypnotic suggestion or in which some inner compulsion drives him to do what he does. So these are supposed to be cases where the same circumstances do number one and they do number two. So let's go through them. 
Uh, they're coerced into doing something. Okay, so coercion, does it cause a person to do a thing or make a person do a thing? Yeah, right? So I, when I coerce somebody, I cause them to do something or I make them do something. I force them to do something. The coercion I see satisfies number one. How about number two? Make it impossible not to do it. Okay, I can sort of see how coercion works. So I say, look, you've, you've got to do it. You have no other choice. Uh, it's impossible for you to pick anything else. I'm going to kill you if you do anything else or I'm gonna chop off your head or something. So coercion, um, hypnotic suggestion, okay, again, does hypnotic suggestion cause a person to do a thing? Yeah, okay, so I hypnotize somebody into doing something, and that's why they do it. Um, does it make it impossible not to do it? Yeah, so, you know, once I've hypnotized them, they can't do anything else. They're stuck doing the thing I've hypnotized them into doing. Or in which some inner compulsion drives him to do what he does. Okay, so does the inner compulsion cause the person to do the thing? Yeah, um, you know, it makes me do the thing. I'm sort of compelled from inside to do something. Does that make it impossible not to do it? Sure, if it's strong enough, if it's very like a strong compulsion, I have no other choice. I've just got to act on this thing. So good. So now I understand these, these are sort of examples. These are illustrations of the principle of alternate possibility. Um, in situations of these kinds, there are circumstances that make it impossible for the person to do otherwise. And these very circumstances also serve to bring it about that he does whatever it is he does. Good, so that's just sort of reiterating the point. We have the circumstances that cause the thing, and also they make it impossible not to do the thing. Now we get to the sentence we were originally trying to figure out. However, so okay, so we have this, but now here's something going against it, or disagreeing with it, or contesting it. However, there may be circumstances that constitute sufficient conditions for a certain action to be performed by somebody, that therefore make it impossible for the person to do otherwise. So I'm going to stop here. Constitute sufficient conditions for a certain action to be performed by someone, and that therefore make it impossible for the person to do otherwise. So we have this and here. So the and is sort of splitting things up. I have two things, something and something else. So I have two ideas. So I want to sort of understand the ideas separately. Um, we have one really long sentence, and I want to start breaking it up to understand it. Sentence number one, sentence number, or phrase number one, phrase number two. So again, I'll put a one over here and a two over here. And the, we also have a therefore, and that therefore, number two. So there may be circumstances that number one constitutes sufficient conditions for a certain action to be performed by somebody, and therefore, number two, make it impossible for the person to do otherwise. So it looks like one is going to lead to two. So one, therefore, two. So when I start figuring out what these are and connect them with each other, there's going to be like an arrow between them. I can't do that in my PDF program, but I have that in my brain. If I were writing this on a piece of paper, I would maybe have these two boxes, and then I'd draw an arrow, and the arrow would maybe say therefore. So first, constitute sufficient conditions for a certain action to be performed by somebody. So uh, what is a sufficient condition for a certain action to be performed by somebody? What is it to constitute a sufficient condition? Well, let's go word by word. So constitute. So constitute is make up, um, or be, or be a part of, or create. Um, I'm going to use make up because that's the sort of clearest synonym I have in my head for constitute. So circumstances that constitute sufficient conditions. So sufficient is enough. So um, it's sufficient, it's enough, you don't need anything more. Once you have something sufficient, you don't need to go beyond that. So make up enough conditions. So what's a synonym for conditions? So circumstances, although he uses circumstances earlier in the sentence, so that might confuse me. Um, so maybe I'll say uh, situations, um, conditions, or maybe how about just factors? Um, make up enough factors for a certain action to be performed by somebody, uh, by someone. So make up enough factors for uh, someone to do a thing. So notice we have make a person do a thing up here. So this do a thing, uh, perform an action, and this is coming back, so doing a thing. So make up enough factors for someone to do a thing. So how could circumstances make up enough factors for someone to do a thing? Well, I guess we've got examples of this up here. So the coercion is enough factors for someone to do a thing. Coercion is sort of enough to get me to do it. Or hypnotic suggestion is enough to make, uh, get me to do it. Or inner compulsion 
uh, makes up enough stuff to get me to do something. Okay, so that's what this first thing is. So there are circumstances that constitute sufficient conditions for certain actions to be performed by somebody. So maybe something like hypnosis or coercion or something. And that therefore make it impossible for the person to do otherwise. Oh, so this is just the same thing as number two up here. So I can just copy and paste. So it's impossible. So this and that therefore this. So it turns out this is just a restatement of this thing up here. So we have this thing and this thing, and now it's the same. But, so he says, however, this thing up here, but that do not actually impel the person to act or in any way produce his action. Ah, huh, that's interesting. So up here, the coercion, the hypnosis, the inner compulsion, they do make the person act or produce his action. So he's saying, there's these things up here, these coercion, hypnosis, whatever, these things exist. These are sort of illustrations of the principle of alternate possibilities. But there's other things that are like this in certain ways. They cause the person to do a thing and they make it impossible not to do it. So they're just like them, but they don't actually impel the person to act or in some way produce his actions. So don't make the person do the thing. So it looks like number two here is the same. Number one, there's a difference here between this one and this one. This one up at the top caused the person to do the thing. It actually makes the person do the thing. But that's not what we have down here. It doesn't make the person do the thing. Here, it just makes up enough factors for someone to do the thing. So it could be enough to make them do the thing. But in this case, it doesn't make them do the thing. So. I'm try maybe if I try to think of an example of this, so maybe I have enough money to buy um, a potato from the store, but the money doesn't sort of uh, uh, make me buy the potato from the store. So I have sufficient, There's some, uh, maybe I have enough money to buy it from the store and also I want the potato, there's enough factors for me to do the thing, but that's not why I buy the potato. Maybe I buy the potato for other reasons. So I have enough things to make me buy the potato, but they don't actually cause me to do it, like up here. So uh, I, I'm, this is like a strange idea. I'm trying to figure out, well, what would, be, what would be these situations? So what are these circumstances he's talking about? Well, maybe he's going to explain it. A person may do something in circumstances that leave him no alternative to doing it without these circumstances actually moving him or leading him to do it. Oh, so this just sounds like a summary of this point here, of point number, well, let's call this three. They don't actually make the person do the thing. So he says, without these circumstances actually moving him or leading him to do it. So this is uh, three. And so we'll copy and paste. Without them playing any role indeed in bringing about what he does. So again, this seems like a restatement. They don't make the person do the thing. So again, we'll just copy and paste three. And so I'm still confused about what these circumstances are, but I sort of know what to have my eyes out for. They're going to be like the coercion or the hypnosis or the inner compulsion in that they make it impossible not to do the thing. And they're going to be close to causing the person to do the thing. They're going to be enough to cause the person to do the thing. They're going to make up enough factors to do the thing. They're going to be sufficient for it, but they're not going to cause the person to do the thing. So I still don't know what fits in the category, but I have my eyes open for that. And then he's going to explain what fits into that category later in the article. So. Um, this has been a refresher on how to read philosophy. This is how you should be treating every sentence, ideally. I know this takes a long time, but look, this paper is only 12 pages long. The first page is a title page, so there's nothing there. The second page is half taken up with whatever the heck this is. And then, uh, let's see, the last page is half taken up with some reviews of letters from Nietzsche. So really, it's closer to 10 pages. So, um, you know, you should be able to take a long, long time to go through... Uh, uh, the articles like this, and this is how you get the most out of uh, reading these articles.